But first of all, I apologize. I apologize for not speaking Spanish or Catalan. And I will speak in English. And I will try to speak slowly so that those of you who speak English will be able to follow. And second, I would like to thank you personally for inviting me to speak to you this afternoon. I can say with pride that I've always been a trade union person and I can even say with pride that I lost a senior job because the employers didn't like my support for trade unions in the International Labour Organization. And I've strongly believed for some years that we need to see a transformation in the role and character of trade unions. And I hope that later in this discussion that we will come to that particular issue. Now, I'm an economist. And economists are boring. And there's nobody more boring than an economist who has just written a book. But every good economics book should begin with a nightmare and end with a dream. This book that has just been published goes one stage further and begins with two nightmares and one dream. And the two nightmares at the beginning of the book are two billionaires. One billionaire who has inherited his wealth from tobacco. And he was addressing a conference of luxury business people in Monaco. And he said to them that he was having a nightmare because people were getting so angry that in his nightmare they were coming at him to kill him. And he told his audience, all very rich people, he said, and you know, they would be right. His name was Johann Rupert, and he actually says it on a video. And one feels his pain. One feels sorry for him. You know, man should not have too many nightmares. But we need more people having nightmares like him. And on the other side of the world, at almost the same time, there was another billionaire talking to a conference and he said that he had been having nightmares because in his dream the sans culotte of the French Revolution were attacking him with the pitchforks and he said and they would be right because our system is a disgrace we, people like me, he said, are making too much money. And it's a very interesting phase in the development of global capitalism <coughs> when the winners are suddenly feeling guilty about overreaching. And we want more of them to have nightmares. And our job is to make more of them have nightmares. Because we are coming. That's the first message. The second thing I want to outline is how I see neoliberalism having developed in the 1980s and 1990s. Neoliberalism represented the triumph of the economists of the right advising Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and the World Bank, the IMF. And they, as you know, 
they introduced a strategy for the commodification of everything that could be commodified, the privatization that, of everything, the individualization of all economic activities, and the systematic dismantling of all institutions and mechanisms of social solidarity. Why? Because those institutions represent a barrier against market forces. It's a very systematic part of the neoliberal agenda. Now, as the triumph of neoliberalism in the world took over, we saw a globalization taking place where an extra two billion people became part of a global labor market. And all of those two billion were habituated <coughs> to expect a living standard of one fiftieth of what a Spanish worker or a British worker or an American worker accepted as the norm. And of course, there has been huge downward pressure on our wages, so that in the last 30 years, in the United States, in Germany, in France, in Britain, every OECD country, real wages have been stagnant or fall. But for the group I'm going to be talking about, the precariat, it's much worse than that. But it's important strategically for us, on the left, to understand that the neoliberal phase of global capitalism has evolved. We are no longer in a neoliberal era or a neoliberal economic system. Because what has happened is they liberalized for financial capital to become hegemonic globally. And financial capital plus the plutocrats have constructed a system of rentier capitalism which represents the triumph of private property rights over free market economic principles. And why I've called this book The Corruption of Capitalism is not that individual people have been doing corrupt things. We all know that. But fundamentally, what the politicians of the right and the institutions of finance and the right have been saying is a lie. They say they favor free markets and open markets and market forces. But they have been building the most unfree market economy ever constructed. That is the essence of the analysis in the first part of the book. What this means is that gradually they created an architecture which institutionally strengthens intellectual property rights through the World Intellectual Property Organization. So they've introduced and multiplied patents, copyright, brands, all of which systematically give a monopoly economic control to multinational corporations. And in doing so, they basically take out of the market competition. If you're a multinational corporation and you have thousands of patents, it means that each patent gives you a monopoly income for 20 years. So a Google or an IBM or Facebook or General Electric, all these big American multinationals, they have bought thousands of patents 
and turned them into billions and billions of dollars for their profits, without competition. The same with copyright. Once copyright is taken, it guarantees a monopoly income for the whole of the life of the person, plus 70 years after they die. Never before has intellectual property rights been converted into a privatized monopoly control system. The estimates I give in the book say that the value of the stock of these intellectual property rights is about $20 trillion, which is about equal to 20% of the whole income of the world. That's the scale. In addition, what governments have been doing is providing subsidies to capital, huge subsidies, building a subsidy state. And in doing so, with giving millions and millions of euros or pounds or dollars to capital and to rich people on the grounds that they must give them because they want to keep them in Spain or in Britain or in the United States. So the state has become a mechanism for giving to the wealthy through subsidies. Subsidies are one of our enemies today. In addition, financial capital has moved to a situation where it wants everybody to be in debt. All of us to be in debt. Because they live off our debts. Financial capital wants us all to be in debt so we keep paying them, obviously. And the next part of the rentier capitalism that has been developing, which is very close to my heart and should be close to your hearts, is what I call the plunder of the commons. We have seen a systematic privatization and commodification of our commons, our lands, our social amenities, our resources, giving away to private interests. And what is really disgusting about this system that has been built is that it has gone with the corruption of democracy itself. So the conservative parties, like the PP, like the British conservatives, like the Republicans in the United States, and so on and so on, have become parties of financial capital. They are no longer the parties of corporate bosses, but they are parties of financial capital. And we can see the corruption going with the revolving doors, that they go into Goldman Sachs, then they go into government, then they go back to Goldman Sachs, then they go to JP Morgan or one of the other big financial systems. So even if your Minister of Finance today is not corrupt, they're preparing themselves to move into Goldman Sachs when they leave office. And as such, they are corrupted because they do things that what please the big financial institutions so that they will be attractive and you can give lots of examples, I give some in this book. The lawyers had to go through the language, but essentially the truth is obvious. That is corruption of democracy that we have today. Now, that is the background context of the growth of the precariat. Because what has been happening is a new class structure has been taking place superimposed on old class structures. And if we are to understand the potential for our struggles, 
in the 21st century, we must understand this class structure. Because it's not the old Marxian class structure of bourgeoisie against the proletariat. It's more complicated. At the top is a plutocracy. These billionaires who are powerful because they can finance the political parties of the right, they are all rentiers. They're taking from property. They're making their money from their money. We know that. A long way below them is an elite of servants all hoping to go into the plutocracy. A long way below them is a salariat. When I was a student of economics in the 1970s, we expected by the end of the 20th century that most workers would have become part of a salaria. Long-term employment security, pensions, paid holidays, paid medical leave, paid maternity leave, that sort of existence. Today, of course, as you know better than I, the salariat is shrinking. And many people in the salariat are worried about their sons and daughters <coughs> not going into the salariat. But one of our problems politically is that the salariat is getting much of their income from rent as well. So from a consciousness point of view, they are inclined to support conservative parties. There's no unified working class. We must face that. And it will not be unified. A long way be below the salariat is the old proletariat for whom the trade unions were formed, labor law, collective bargaining, the international labor organization, the system of social democratic parties and socialist parties, all were geared to the proletariat. In the early part of the last century, and in the middle decades of the 20th century, all of those things were progressive by historical standards. But we must understand that in the 21st century, it is not progressive. It was always sexist. It always gave priority to labor rather than work. It ignored the work that women were doing outside the labor market. It ignored all the forms of work that are not labor. So that in ignoring that, it was ignoring a very, very important creative part of our existence. <coughs> and it was hierarchical. It favored those people in stable employment over those who were not in stable employment. But leave that aside for the moment. It's below the proletariat, which is shrinking, is the precariat. And you can define the precariat in three dimensions. And it's important to see all three of those dimensions. The first dimension, using classic Marxian terminology, is that people in the precariat have distinctive relations of production. What this means first is they are being told and habituated to accept a life of unstable labor. They're told to be flexible. They're told to be insecure. But I ask you not to use the term precarious labor or precarious work. That's not the same thing. I'll show you why later. That aspect of the precariat is the most obvious and it's the one most journalists say, ah, standing is just talking about casual labor, unstable labor. We've always had that. Of course we have. 
And for me, this is the least important aspect of the precariat. If other things existed, we would be able to put up with short-term jobs. Who wants to be in long-term boring jobs? Who wants to be in the same job for 30 years? Who wants to be a bar person or a cleaner in that hotel for 40 years? It's crazy. We don't, the answer to the precariat is not to push people into long-term stable jobs. When I'm talking to a group on the precariat anywhere in the world, if I talk, start talking about the need for long-term stable employment, they will all do this. The second aspect of this first dimension is much more important. It is that people in the precariat don't have an occupational identity, an occupational narrative to give to their lives, a sense that their work and labor is leading them to be developing their capabilities and developing their personality and developing themselves as citizens. <laughs> the third aspect is that if you are in the precariat, you have to do a lot of work for labor that does not get counted or remunerated. You have to network more. You have to spend more time working outside labor time, outside workplaces. You have to retrain because the last lot of retraining <coughs> was proven obsolescent before you could finish it. You have to spend a lot of time waiting around. You have to spend a lot of time working for the state, filling in forms, queuing, trying to get benefits. All of this is work. But our statistics, our official government statistics, don't say anything about that. They treat it as leisure, which is crazy. <coughs> and one of the things we need to do, it's very boring, very mundane, is to demand that governments overhaul their labor statistics. Because they're telling a lie. They're not revealing the extent of work that people in the precariat have to do. So they give a picture as if they're lazing around and not doing anything. When in actual fact they are probably working harder than anybody in full-time jobs. And the next aspect of the precariat, which is unique historically, is that on average the level of education is higher than the level of labor they typically can obtain. Now that combination of circumstances provides people in the precariat with a sense of existential insecurity. A feeling of frustration, a feeling of alienation, a feeling that you're out of control. You don't have control of your time, and you're facing insecurity. The second dimension is actually more subtle than it sounds, which is that for the precariat, they have to rely almost entirely on money wages. They do not get access to non-wage benefits, paid holidays, <coughs> paid medical leave, the prospect of a pension, all of these things, they don't get. They're losing <coughs> those things. And in losing them, the income inequality is actually greater than shown by our statistics. Because the salariat is gaining them more longer holidays, more pensions, all of these things, while the precariat is losing them. So if you measured full income, you would see the inequality has grown more than the statistics suggest. The next aspect, though, is that while average wages in real terms have been stagnant or declining, 
For the precariat, they've been going down sharply. And they're becoming much more volatile and much more unpredictable. And this is a critical point for what sort of social policy we should be thinking about because people in the precariat are facing a life of economic uncertainty. And this uncertainty is different from the old welfare system because it's not just a matter of national insurance. Economic uncertainty means that any time you could be starting to lose income. You can't have an insurance against that. So your social policy should be designed to think, how do we respond to this economic uncertainty? And because real wages have fallen, people in the precariat are always living on the edge of unsustainable debt. I needn't tell you about that in Spain, but everywhere. This is a reality of the precarity. One mistake, one accident, one illness, and you could be out in the street. And this plays on the mind. And in addition, the state has reformed social security and welfare in the direction of targeting, means testing, behavior testing, and a sort of residual policy. The reform that was announced yesterday in Barcelona, I found very sad because it's the same direction <coughs> as many governments have been going, to make means testing a feature of social welfare. And what it does is this. If you say the poor, and you make the category the poor, you target your social benefits on the poor. That means for if you're in the precariat, going from low benefits into low wage jobs that are the sort that's available, it means that such a person will face a marginal tax rate of 80% or more because they will only get a little extra from wages than they were receiving in benefits. It's a poverty trap. It's the same in Germany, it's the same in Britain, it's the same in Scandinavia, the same in the United States. That means the precariat are facing a marginal tax rate of 80%. Can you imagine what would happen if the middle class or the upper classes were paying a marginal tax rate of 80%? There will be huge demonstrations, huge demands, huge say, we're going to leave the country. We're going to go elsewhere. 80% is terrifying. And yet that is what the system expects the precariat to pay. But it's actually worse than that. Because if you are in the precariat and you lose a job, you don't start receiving benefits tomorrow morning. You have to fill in forms, you have to queue, you have to fill in criteria, you have to show that you're job searching, etc. So the data show in country after country, when you go in that direction, the next thing that happens is people say, well, is that person poor because they are lazy or poor because of an accident? So let's do some investigation. And in doing that, they create what I call a precarity trap. So if you're in the precarious, and you finally get a benefit, and then along comes some bureaucrat and says, you must take a short-term job the other side of Barcelona. It may only last three or four weeks. It may only pay the minimum wage, but you must take it. You would be an idiot to want to take it. Because you'd only get an extra 20%.
and very quickly you would be losing the job. And then you would have to go back and queue and start to ask for benefits again. And you could be without benefits for two or three months. And you very easily work it out, you'd be losing more than you'd gain by taking such a job. And yet the system in country after country is forcing people to do precisely that. That second part of income insecurity is something that everybody in the precariat understands. But it leads to the third part, which for me and the numerous groups I've addressed around the world is the most important part of all. If you are in the precariat, you have a distinctive relation to the state, to the institutions, not just the government, the institutions around you. You are systematically losing rights. When you're in the precariat, you lose civil rights. If you need justice, you cannot get it. You cannot pay. If a bureaucrat takes a benefit away from you, you can't do anything because you don't have the financial or legal capacity to do anything. You're losing cultural rights because you cannot belong to a community that gives you your identity and gives you your ethics and reciprocities. You're losing economic rights because you cannot practice, cannot do what you're qualified to do. You're losing social rights because the way the social security system is developing is not giving you rights, it's giving you conditional benefits, means tested benefits, behavior tested. These are not rights. And you're losing political rights because you do not see in the political spectrum a political movement or politicians who are articulating a strategy for the precariat. And ultimately, what's the most important issue of all, which people in the precariat understand, is that you are reduced to being a supplicant. This is the most important psychological issue of the precariat. You have to ask for favors. You have to ask people to be charitable. You have to show gratitude. You have to satisfy a bureaucrat. You have to plead with figures. An image that comes to mind when I think about this is it's like running on sinking sand and you can't escape. You're constantly faced by anxiety, insecurity, alienation. And all of this breeds anger. And the anger is justified. Now, at the moment, the precariat is a dangerous class because it is split into factions. The first part consists of people who've fallen out of the proletariat into the precariat, they don't have a lot of education. And they think yesterday was better than today. And I call them the atavists because they listen to the neo-fascist populists. This group is the group that votes for Donald Trump. This part is the group that votes for Marine Le Pen. This group will be voting for Brexit and for Ma Theresa May next month. This group is a reactionary group. And they listen to these neo-fascists blaming the second part of the precariat, the migrants, the Roma, the disabled, demonizing people who are actually part of the precariat themselves. 
And this second part, at the moment, is politically disenfranchised. But because they're vulnerable, they keep their heads down. They will not come out strongly in favor of unions because they dare not. But we have to appeal to them as part of a new politics. It's the third part of the precaria that are defining the politics of tomorrow. And they are what I call the progressives. They're the millions of people around the world who are going to universities and colleges and they know they're paying for a lottery ticket. And that lottery ticket is worth less and less and costing more and more to get. And they come out mostly entering the precariat and they're angry. But they won't be voting for the Donald Trumps and the Marine Le Pen's and the neo-fascists. They are looking for a new progressive politics, a politics of paradise, with a little utopia, a little excitement, a sense of a future, a good society. And this part of the precariat, we must understand and realize the traditional trade unions are not appealing to them. I say that with sadness, <coughs> genuine sadness. But it means we must change. We must transform our vocabulary, our imagery, our strategy. Because I often joke, you know, if I'm talking to a big precariat group, any country, if I want to get everybody running for the bar, to have a drink, a beer or a wine, I start talking about trade unions. That is terrible. I want it when you or any of us are talking to them, they come from the bar. <coughs> because we are relevant to their agenda. And I think we have to understand that this part of the precariat in a muddled sort of way is talking about reinventing the enlightenment values. Reinventing the values of liberté, fraternité, égalité. And that is the agenda for the future. The precariat in this part want work. They're not trying to avoid work. But they want work that gives them dignity, gives them a development capacity. They want work which has security and dignity. And one way of putting the predicament from our point of view is this. For the old proletariat, the primary enemy or antagonist was the boss, the employer, capital. For the precariat, the primary antagonist today is not the boss, it's the state. It's the state which establishes the contours of exploitation and oppression. It's the state which strengthens rentier capitalism. It's the state which becomes corrupted by finance. And we have to articulate an agenda which prioritizes financial capital, property, rescuing the commons, giving people security. And it's that perspective that I try to outline in the final chapter of this book, and I've just produced another one to make it doubly boring. Just come out in English, not yet in Spanish. Only came out this week on basic income. Summarizing over 30 years of my life of work on basic income. And in that regard, I'd like to conclude my speech by saying why basic income 
must be part of our progressive strategy for tomorrow. A basic income means that every man, every woman and every child should have an economic right to a modest basic income paid each month without conditions and be a permanent right. That's how you define it. And you can justify moving to a basic income with three philosophical arguments. <coughs> Three moral arguments, if you like. The first is that a basic income should be perceived as a matter of social justice. The wealth and income of all of us, every single one of us, is far more to do with the achievements and efforts of our ancestors over many generations than anything we do ourselves. And if you allow private inheritance of wealth, which is something for nothing for a minority, then you should be able to see a basic income as a sort of social dividend on the collective wealth of society. That gives it a solid philosophical justification. It's also a matter of ecological justice. Because it is the affluent using labor, using resources that are creating the pollution. But the precariat and other low income groups are the ones paying the price in pollution and global warming and loss of space. So in a sense you could see a basic income as a sort of compensatory device for the injustice of pollution. And the unions and the left must articulate these issues and not be frightened to do so. In addition, a basic income would enhance republican freedom. Enhance the sense that you can say no. Very important, we've done pilots in various countries. And one of the most important findings particularly for women, is if they have a basic income, they know they can say no to an oppressive relationship, no to an oppressive employer in extremis. They can say, I don't know how you say it in Spanish, but in English, fuck off. I don't know how you translate I'm sure he will do it. You can say, you can say, look, I want to be emancipated. And a basic income has an emancipatory value greater than the money value. We have found that. It induces people to join collective bodies. It induces people to feel they are part of a community and they must fight for the community. That sense of freedom is something that too often those of us who support trade unions and those who support left politics have neglected. We've allowed the political right to capture the dialogue of freedom. But we believe in freedom. It's fundamental to ourselves. But we've allowed them to capture the language of freedom. Basic income is a way of saying no. We believe in the freedom of the precariat, we believe the freedom of our members, we believe the freedom of society. And freedom induces people to be more tolerant, more involved. And that leads to the third ethical or moral reason for supporting a basic income today. <coughs> the psychologists and others have shown that basic security is a fundamental human need. If you are insecure, your IQ goes down. Your mental stability goes down. Your bandwidth of mental imagination shrinks. And you lose the capacity to make long-term decisions in a responsible way. Most 
of us would nod and say, yeah. But we don't have any policy now to give people basic security. The politicians say, be more flexible. But we all know that means be more insecure. And we should say, no, we want basic security because basic security is a human need. And at the moment, the inequality of security is greater than the inequality of income. If you're up here in the salariat or the elite, you have total security. If you're down in the precariat, you have no security. None. And a basic income would give basic security. It may not be much, but it will. And the psychologists and our pilots have shown that people who have basic security are more tolerant of others. They're more altruistic. They're more empathetic towards their fellow human beings. And ultimately, what differentiates those of us on the left from the conservatives is a sense of empathy. The ability to put yourself in the other person's shoes, and I may not, dis I may not agree with you, but to allow you to do what you want to do. That sense of empathy, as long as you do no harm to others. Whereas the conservative mind is moralistic. It starts from the premise that you must behave in a proper way, and I know the way you should behave. And therefore we're going to lead you to behave properly, and if not, punish you. <coughs> it's a sort of Catholic, Catholic mentality, excuse me if anybody's religious. But it goes with a sort of moralistic hypocrisy. Whereas on the left you believe in empathy. That's the fundamental difference between someone on the left and the right, in my view. I want to end on this point because I believe today we are at a very exciting point. It looks to all of us as if we're losing. We see Donald Trump. We see Macron, a middleman, ex-banker, winning. You see the PP triumphing even though the corruption is so endemic. We're going to see in my country Theresa May and the Conservative <coughs> right have a landslide <coughs> in next month. But the precariat is growing. The precariat is beginning to form new movements. They may not be ideal at the moment, but if you look back in history, what is happening is actually very quick. We're seeing movements that are posing different questions. We're seeing movements that represent the precariat and are exciting. I don't need to say what names in Spain and Catalonia, you know them. They may not be perfect, but we need to be working with them because we need to realize the enemy is financial capital and rentier capitalism. And therefore we should bury our differences and be coherent to attack them. But if you think from the perspective of the precariat, you come up with different priorities and different language than if you think in the old pro proletariat way. And that is what I plead the unions to try to do. To transform our character, transform the language, transform the images, and instead of being defensive, actually become part of the party, the movement that builds a good society for the future. When we do that, the precariat will be going. I'm with you. But unless we do that, they will continue to ignore. And that we do not want. But I'm genuinely optimistic that the energy out there is fantastic. It is fantastic. We must not despair because of defeats today.
But we must have courage. We must have courage. Thank you very much for listening.